Hi, my name's Sarah Heath. I'm a veterinary specialist in behavioural medicine. And in this short video, we're going to be talking about behavioural first aid for the confrontational dog, giving some advice about what we should be telling clients in order to manage these cases until maybe referral is possible or we can give more in-depth advice. So, of course, the most important consideration when we're dealing with confrontational behaviour is what do we mean by that? What is the nature of the confrontation? Because of course, it can take many different forms. And accurate information is absolutely essential about the nature of the behaviour, because that is the way we're going to reach an accurate diagnosis in terms of motivation. Of course, in all of the cases, we need a risk assessment as well. And we need to make sure that safety considerations are paramount. So the first thing is to think about who is at risk, what is the level of risk and how can we manage that? But remember that when somebody reports confrontational behaviour, that's going to be according to their perception. And we know that confrontational behaviour is a spectrum. So in the SYNC model of behavioural medicine, we talk about the repulsion technique. So using repel repelling behaviour, and that is on a spectrum of intensity, maybe as simple as curling a lip or maybe actually growling or grumbling or air snapping. But of course, may also be a bite. And the perception as to how intense and how significant that behaviour is, is often from the human caregiver. So it's really important that we get an accurate description that leads us to an motivational diagnosis. By the way, check out the code in the description for 50% off your first webinar at WebinarVet. Animals don't show confrontational behaviour for no reason. Often you'll have people tell you that it's come out of the blue, that it was totally unpredictable, that they didn't see it coming. But what's important from our perspective professionally is to remember that from the animal's perspective, it will have had a reason. When we talk about repulsion, we think about that as being a response to so-called protective emotions, those emotions such as fear and anxiety and pain. Remember also, though, that frustration, which is also a protective emotion, increases confrontational behaviour that is not necessarily repelling in nature. So, for example, if we have a dog who's chasing a squirrel and is motivated by desire seeking to grab that squirrel, but it runs up a tree and therefore frustrates the dog, the dog may be at the bottom of the tree barking and bouncing and growling, but they're not repelling the squirrel. Repulsion has the aim of making the squirrel go away. And that's the opposite of what this dog wants to achieve. They want the squirrel to come back down the tree so they can catch it. So confrontational behaviour is not always repelling in nature. If it comes from a frustration motivation, it may actually not have that immediate desire. But of course, from our perspective as human caregivers, it can be difficult to differentiate when all you're seeing is a dog that's barking or growling or grumbling or snapping. So let's move on then to what we need to do from a professional point of view. I think the most important thing is to be careful about terminology. The term aggression or aggressive is not really very helpful because it has to be defined. It, aggression or aggressive are terms that are very much subjective to the individual who says them and to their perception. So accurate description of what actually is happening rather than reliance on human interpretation is vital if we're going to give appropriate advice to the caregiver. So for it, first of all, let's think about the so-called W questions. So I think about it in terms of what I need to know about this incident that the caregiver is reporting can be divided into the questions related to W. First of all, what? What did the dog actually do? so that we can get a definition of whether it was a grumble, a growl, a snap, etc. The next thing we want to ask is where? Where did this incident happen? What was the context? Because context is all important in deciding the underlying motivation for a behaviour. Next W question is when? When did this happen? 
when is in relation to perhaps time of day or in relation to activity levels of the dog or experiences of what's just happened. And then the next W question is whom? Who was the target of this confrontational behaviour? Was it a dog? Was it a person? If it was a person or a dog, were they familiar or were they unfamiliar? So we've now got a description of what the dog did, when and where it did it and who was involved. But of course, the absolute crucial question is why? Because confrontational behaviour can happen for more than one reason. Yes, it's very likely to occur in a repelling nature in relation to protective emotion. So we need to think about whether there's anything in the answers to those W questions that leads us to believe that the animal was protecting itself from something either real or perceived. Is it fear, anxiety? Could it potentially be pain? So that brings us back in veterinary behavioural medicine always to ensuring that we've considered physical health factors as well as emotional ones. I just want to go through the steps then. So the first step when dealing with this reported confrontational behaviour is risk assessment and safety. We must keep everybody safe. What does that mean? Well, we need to protect the dog from making any more mistakes, from behaving in a way that is unacceptable, both in terms of just, of course, it's unacceptable for anyone to have the potential to be injured, but also from a legal perspective, because the Dangerous Dogs Act actually talks about reasonable apprehension that injury may occur. There doesn't have to be an actual injury for a Dangerous Dogs Act prosecution to be a potential. So we must protect both the dog and the caregiver from a repeat of the incident. We think about employing what we call barrier methods. The importance of barrier methods is that the animal can still express its emotion. So it can till, still tell us that it's in a protective state or that it's frustrated, for example, but there can't be a consequence of anyone becoming injured. Sorts of examples of barrier methods would be segregation, so closed doors or baby gates, or things like leads or harnesses, or things like muzzles. And also, of course, just avoidance of problematic situations goes back to your answers to the when and where, the context questions. Because if these um, incidents only ever happen when the dog's in the pub, the most important first piece of advice is don't go to the pub with your dog. Don't put your dog into a context where we know there is a risk that there could be a confrontational response. As I alluded to just before, whilst we're at this stage of thinking about risk, the next thing as well is to think about physical health. Pain may be top of our list of things to consider. Chronic pain, of course, has two effects. One is that it increases protective valence. It makes you more protectively biased. And also, of course, that it raises emotional arousal. Pain is an emotion as well as a sensory and motor experience. And if you have high levels of chronic pain, then you effectively have high levels of arousal and therefore less capacity. In the sink analogy used as for, um, by myself to describe behavioural health in our patients, think about it in terms of the pain being a dripping tap, a constant slow input of emotion that takes up capacity and means that that individual is not going to be able to cope with some other input. So it's not that the pain is the only problem, but the pain is contributing. But any physical health problem that alters your emotional state, and that may be neurological, it may be gastrointestinal, maybe dermatological, so many situations, endocrine disorders that alter emotional bias and valence can also be involved in situations of confrontational behaviour. So a health check for physical health factors is absolutely crucial. Once we've considered those physical factors, of course, we need to think about emotion. And from the history, we hopefully have got some idea of which motivation is involved. That will lead to specific advice, which you may be able to provide in-house if you have the expertise available. But you may also at this point be thinking about referral. 
As well as changing that underlying motivation, though, we need to think about arousal. And we can give really useful advice in terms of reducing the amount of residue of emotion in the sink analogy, the amount of water in the sink. So making sure that the dog has good drainage. Are they getting enough sleep? Dogs need 16 to 18 hours of sleep in every 24. So could we talk about sleep in terms of provision of opportunity to sleep? Is the bed in a good location so the dog is undisturbed when sleeping? Is there any situation of social tension in the household that's creating an inability for this individual to get sufficient rest? And could we modify that by segregating the dogs or by changing the location of the bed? Also, thinking about chewing opportunities. Chewing is a way in which dogs dissipate emotion. We also are going to think about how we might help the dog to be less aroused using things like pheromones or nutraceuticals. Adapt till calm, particularly useful in this context, placed near to the resting place of the individual, can help to improve the quality of sleep when it does occur, as well as improving a slight bias towards engaging emotional state and reducing the level of anxiety. Also, we think about environmental factors that could be leading to arousal. Is there too much noise in the household, too much human activity around the dog? Does the dog get enough opportunity to be protected from high levels of arousal? Reducing the amount of verbal interaction with the dog, so not um, wasting words around the dog that are meaning the dog's hanging and waiting for the next instruction. Maybe reducing a little bit of the direction of behaviour. So trying not to give so many cues and, and um, pieces of information to the dog so that it can rest more. Also think about triggers. Can we move the post box away from the house? Can we put one at the end of the drive? Can we put temporary frosting on the windows to reduce the amount of stimulation that's coming from outside? So think in terms of not just the motivation, the valence of emotion, because changing that does take time and expertise, but also think about just turning those emotional taps either off or down, reducing arousal so that this individual will have more available emotional capacity and will be more likely to make a good decision in the future. These problems, though, are serious. If there is reporting of confrontational behaviour, we must take it seriously. But get a good, accurate description, put in place safety um, measures and safety advice. Make sure you've given a clinical examination and ruled out potential physical health factors and then give advice about reducing emotional arousal and referring or giving specific advice in house about changing motivation. I hope that's helpful. In these short videos, it's not possible to go into in-depth advice. But if you do need any more, please don't hesitate to ask.